Blah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is the first part of the John Christ interview. We sort of just jump into talking about how John Christ learned how to play guitar again. And, you know, I knew he had an accident, but I didn't really understand the the full depth of what had happened to him. He had suffered a major head injury and had to learn how to walk again, like all this stuff, man. And it's powerful to hear John talk about this stuff because I know I've talked about it a lot on this channel. And I know for me personally, like there are times where I feel like throwing in the towel or giving up or getting too frustrated, but hearing John's story and what he went through, you know, just so that he could get back to a place where he was playing guitar and having to sort of relearn everything that he knew and more, man, it's like, it's an incredible story. He he has such a he has such a powerful story. He is such a power of example of I mean, the dude really should just be giving TED Talks. And it sounds like I'm kind of joking when I say that, but I'm like ultra dead serious. That dude should be like engaged on speaking tours, telling the story about how he wrecked his body in this car accident and basically pulled himself back together. You know, it's harrowing to listen to him tell it. And there were several times where I got like deeply emotional inside and you'll see me. I don't know. Maybe you won't see me because I'm wearing the glasses, but I, I just I had no idea. I had no friggin idea. So, you know, I, I really hope that like John keeps doing interviews and and you know, talks about his story and it must be hard to talk about. I really want to thank John for being so candid and open and you know, uh, voluntarily sharing all this stuff with me and with now with all of you. I also really want to thank my friend Ace Von Johnson for helping to put this all together. It was really great to have him as a co-host. I insisted on it because Ace is a huge fan of all this stuff and he is a great guitar player who has a deep musical knowledge that I do not possess. And you'll notice there are several times where he just comes in the clutch asking the questions that I can't ask, you know? We're due for a second recording session to continue this conversation. So keep your eyes peeled for that in the future. And as always, make sure you check out the Patreon. I'm not a crowdfunding kind of guy, but it takes... You know, it takes overhead to do some of this stuff and some of the things that I aspire to do. And I'm not the kind of guy that is really looking to to crowdfund. I don't want to crowdfund. I don't really, that's just not my, it's just not what I want to do. It's not what I want to do. I've had terrible experiences doing it. And the thing that I love about Patreon is that it, it allows me to offer something in exchange for your support. So please take a moment and check out the Patreon. There is a whole archive full of material that is not available on the channel publicly. I do early exclusives, secret shows, and special, you know, behind the scenes outtakes, all sorts of stuff from my personal archive, my vast, my vast archive of material. As you'll hear me say in the spiel, when you add up all of the hours and hours and hours of video or audio, whoa, well, that was, I'm going to leave that in because that was kind of funny that that happened. <laughs> when you look at all of it added up and you realize that you're, you're not even paying, you're paying fractions, it's fractions of pennies, your great value. It, bleh, dude, you don't know how long it took me to record this whole intro. I, I just, I don't have it today. In any case, check out the Patreon. Go follow Ace Von Johnson on Twitter and Instagram. And he has a Patreon too. Check that out. And also make sure to follow John Christ on all of his social medias. He's got Instagrams and Facebooks and Twitters and whatnots. And now let's dive right in. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. 
in my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it gonna be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. <laughs> yes. Oh, you're recording anything. It's all right, I'm, I, I can... Uh... I think it's working. Can you hear it's that? Working. It sounds the loud. No, I can get louder. Awesome. That's your call. We can hear it for sure. It sounds great. It's, it sounds evil. Oh, it's evil, Jerry. <laughs> now, right now, I'm playing with a cut up fifty cent piece. Whoa! If you, if you want Wait, why do you why do you use a cut up fifty cent piece? Because I can, uh, because it's kind of, it was a gift from a student and uh, he, we were doing some, um, doing some queen stuff. But I said, no, 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 we need to go. To had a bite, you know? Wow. kind of works yeah um That'll so work <laughs> that actually that leads me into right off the bat into my first question 
let's just launch right into it. When, and this is a question not just for you, uh, John, but also for you, Ace, as well. Like, you know, I, I realize, like, you really have to warm up, warm yourself up before you start playing because you've just got to move your fingers around so much up and down the neck. What is that process like for you in general? Go ahead, Ace. Oh, I don't a, know. A, a, I think Ace is you, you get the IPA, <laughs> you, you find the opener, mm-hmm. and then you put it on the bottle top and you lift. That's kind of the warm up. Yeah. For guns, right? I mean, it's more of a Jack Daniels kind of vibe. <laughs> you're, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wrong group. <laughs> uh I, you know i don't i don't do a whole lot of warm-up stuff if i if i have time i'll sit down and and maybe just do a couple things up and down the neck um like little chromatic runs sort of i, I don't know what the proper terminology would be john would definitely know better than i would but just sort of like z patterns like across the you know like one two three four two three four five three four five six etc etc et yeah. and just do some some vibrato stuff and, and you know for i don't i don't put a lot of thought into it. maybe five minutes at most and then it, you know and, and then I hit the hit the deck. And here's the, here's the thing, you know, there there is no right way or wrong way. Sure. Um, I one of my biggest caveats is that I tend to over prepare, over practice, over warm up. And the problem with that is you get out on stage and you've already used your freshest stuff. Mm. You know, so. If, if I can keep it to purely drills, what I had to do when I go before a gig or whatever, I warm up with completely different music. Like I'll do all classical and no rock and roll. Yeah. So when I hit the stage, you know. You know, when it goes in. I'm just like I'm in it. I'm in it. If I do too much of the songs before, I, I had a piano teacher said, "Do not practice the day of your lesson." Yeah, it, agree. It'll it'll ruin your lesson. Warm up, do your stuff, you know. And what he's talking about is he's talking about these. chromatic type of stuff, you know. All that kind of stuff is great, you know, to get your get your hands going um, and just to get them synced together. Don't sound very musical. It doesn't have to, though. I mean, you're that's it's warm up stuff. It's not like that's part of the show, you know. What do you mean when you say synced together? What does that mean? Like, why do you have to sync your hands? And I'm like, again, I'm not a musician, so but I'm fascinated by this stuff. So what does that Uh, mean exactly? All right. So what it means is I'll I'll paint a picture for you, right? Uh, I'm flying into L.A. and I'm going to be jamming with Ace with Faster Pussycat at the Whiskey at 1130. My flight is delayed in Chicago, right? I'm supposed to be there at 6 p.m. I'm sitting on an airplane on a tarmac while they're de-icing the thing. And I'm, start- <laughs> I'm starting to sweat, right? Yeah. I'm going, I hope my guitar gets there. Or better yet, you know, Ace will just strap something on and say, okay, here you go, rock star, go. Yeah, but, we did that. <laughs> yeah. So the more stuff, I'm losing my headphones here. The more stuff like that happens, um, you you show up at a gig. By the time you get your hands on a guitar, they're shaking, and the left hand doesn't even remember who the right hand is anymore. So you got to get them back together. And with with guitar playing, it's very it's very technical. You know that the timing for the pick strokes. If you're doing something. Give me a song, Ace. Something that has a oh. <laughs> right? You want that you want that to be tight. If it's not, it's 
Grease just washes out. Right? So you want everything to be synced. And when you're doing... It's different if it's sloppy. You, you lose your definition. Yeah. And you don't want to start with your hardest stuff because you're not going to go right into like... That's hard to do cold, right? Yeah. You know, you're better um You can kind of groove it and get it. Everybody's warming up. Right? You just kind of yeah. slide around. And the thing is, when you go on stage, everything's exaggerated. You're playing much harder. When I'm sitting here and I'm relaxing. Right? That's nice. Sorry, you're hearing my driveway alarms going oh, okay. off. Okay. I was <laughs> like, where's the beeping coming from? <laughs> uh, somebody's gone. Somebody's crossed the perimeter. So I got to reset the 50 cal on the roof. Give me a second. I want to set that tripod there. Sure. Okay. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I figured. I don't have a 50 cal on the roof as far as you know. Yeah. That's a right. fuck around and find out kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So there's certain type of techniques that, you know, we're, when we're playing blues, right? You know. Right. Nice blues, nice slow. No big deal. You can. It's great stuff to start out with, but if you're going to start off with M.I. Demon. Just look at the right hand. Does this for five and a half minutes. I only get a break here. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right back. It's just going on all day long, right? You'll tighten up and cramp up, and that's the worst feeling in the world. So once, the other thing is what happens with guitar overuse, if you strain the tendons because the larger muscles are already cramping and you have to use the smaller ones, they'll work as hard as they can till they can't work, and then the tendons start to take over to compensate. As soon as you fire up your tendons, you're sore for two months and your elbows are in ice bags after yeah. every show. It's not fun. Yeah. You know, it's bad enough. We come off stage and we got to have ice packs on our neck and back and all that geezer stuff. But <laughs> if our wrists and forearms get sore, then we're in trouble. Yeah. Um. Now, you know, what, what I'm amazed by watching, watching you play right now, you had to sort of like reteach yourself how to play guitar from as from what i've read in interviews correct you sort of yeah. had to like relearn can you i mean generally that's something you would talk about at the end of an interview or something but since we're here and you're talking about this stuff can you explain what some of your process was like because i'm in i'm in such awe of watching you do this and i under i don't want to ex explain it for you 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 can but i I'm seeing what you're doing and I'm like amazed that you can do the thing that you taught yourself how to do, if you could explain. So, you know, what I tell people now is, um, it was actually a blessing that I had to learn it, how to do it again, <laughs> because I finally learned it right. Mm. <laughs> you know, the first time I did it the way we all do with records and cassette tapes back in the time. And I had a, Montgomery Ward's cassette tape, and if I jammed a screwdriver between the play and fast forward button, it would slow it down mm. like a, a third, right? And but every most I took lessons as a kid, um, classical and then rock and all that fun stuff. But what you're talking specifically is after the accident, um, everything changed. 
Um, it's not the most pleasant conversation, but I think it's important because uh, it gave me what now when I meet people and I teach students, I get them from age five to age 85. So from a five year old that doesn't have the strength to even fret one string yeah. to somebody in their 60s, 70s and 80s with arthritis that can't stretch a finger even a fret apart. They can't do that. They they can't split their fingers apart. So you have to rewrite the rule book for them. Now, what happened to me was that the nerves that control um, your pinky and your ring finger were smashed. So there was no signal going to these. And these, uh, three fingers are all crushed so they've all got pins i got like nine screws or something in them um and essentially except for my thumb and my index finger uh for a year that there was nothing that was it and they're, they're like maybe harmonica is better for you oh. <laughs> Fuck. so and i can remember you know they, they weren't concerned about my hand because I broke my back and that was the primary concern. You know, I, I had to be on my back for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then they they construct these great braces that basically stand you up, you know. Um, but I was grateful because of the people in the hospital beds next to me. Some of them were never going to walk again. And I had to learn how to walk again, but I knew I would. Yeah. So when it came to guitar, I wasn't even, you know, I, <laughs> that, that was so far in the future. Um, and it was, it was ironic during the time that the accident happened, I was, I was working on a book for Cherry Lane Music called Shortcuts in the Practice Zone. And, and the, the content was done. I just hadn't recorded the examples yet. And for some reason, I, the phone rang in the hospital room and it was the editor saying, I'm glad you're alive, man. Don't worry about the book. That was one of my first memories of waking up. I'm like, what book? Yeah. <laughs> wow. What, yeah. what, what year was this, John? Uh, 2003. Okay. So 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I remember, you know, when I first got home, uh, I pulled out my acoustic guitar and, uh, and, I I could fret the fifth fret on the first string, fifth fret A. I could fret that, but only for like two seconds, and I, I couldn't even open my hand. I couldn't, and, it, it, you know, so I just bawled, you know, I just lost it. I, yeah. I put it away, and, uh, and so it, that, it all started from there. Um, and thank goodness there's a place in Valencia called hand mechanics and they did physical therapy, occupational therapy, and they were hand specialists. So, um, you know, three times a week I went and they did all the therapy and the big thing was, uh, uh was stretching. I couldn't open my hand all the way and I couldn't close my knuckles all the way. So, uh, months and months of, of therapy and things and trying, and they had special machines and drills and they, and I've turned everything into like, um, warm up routines and practice routines. So I made it a guitar exercise for me. I just couldn't hold the guitar yet. Yeah. So we tried to customize things that work for my brain. And even in the beginning, I kept, I kept saying the wrong words. Uh, I was thinking, I was trying to tell him that, um, you know, I, I was tired and I wanted to go home and the word hotel kept coming out. I still confuse home and hotel to this day. And they would look at me and go, why do you keep wanting to go to a hotel? And I'm like, you know, so I knew I had a ways to go. So they put you through therapy six months and they cut you loose. You're pretty much on your own. And they say, you know, swelling's going to go down. Um, they did some nerve surgeries and all that, but then it, it was just 
little by little when nobody was around, you know, I'd take the back brace off, I'd take the neck brace off, and I had all these special clamps and rubber bands, like Frankenstein looking things on my fingers. And, uh, <clears throat> and I just started with just two finger bar cords, you know, smoke on the water all over yeah. again. So, and I couldn't feel anything. So I didn't know how much pressure uh, I was putting on the fingers. So I had to watch everything. So I practiced wow. in front of practice in front of a mirror. And I tell all my students to this day, sit in front of a mirror and practice. It's better for your posture and it gives you a different type of feedback. And when you can see your fingers moving, it's a different way of sending the message. So how did I do it? The way I did it was I had to teach my brain to send individual messages to each finger until the finger started to move. Because all the, all the reflex, all the normal automatics, it was all gone. Wow. All of it. So to get my pinky to move, it, it probably took months because it was just my middle finger that was answering that message. So it, it got to my middle finger, but it didn't cross over to the other fingers. And these were the fingertips from the third joint to the end are still numb. I was burning them all the time because I couldn't feel anything. You know, I pick up something hot and I would smell burning flesh, but I didn't feel it. It was my finger because of nerve damage. So it, the beauty of it is I lost the sensation of touch, but the, the, the surgeries were brilliant. Surgeons were brilliant. They, they gave the motion back. So I just had to figure out to how to coordinate it all. And since I didn't have my normal, I couldn't sense the, the difference between the skinny E string and the thick E string just wasn't there. So the index finger had to do all the checking and all this crazy movement, but I could hear it. My ear, well, my left ear was good. I lost the hearing in my right ear for about six months. So I was sitting with my left ear and I gradually just started looking in the mirror, playing a note, bending it and listening to what it did. So it just to change the way that I sent the commands to the fingers. Eventually they learned what we had to do, but you know, it was a long time before I could play an F major seven chord or a C major seven chord like this. You know, these sort of, oh, that was out of the question. There was none of that. That took uh, six and a half years before I wow. could play lead guitar again. Oh my God. So, wow. yeah, I, so I stayed off the grid, you know, I, uh, I had a, what did I have? My, I had a business partner. We had special effects trucks. We had water trucks. We had some grip trucks. I was into the movie industry now. So our company, Hollywood Fires, we did a bunch of car commercials, a bunch of movies. You know, we had some little TV series, NCIS, and some of these other things, numbers, a few other things. So we rented out, we were a rental company, and we operated out of his dad's yard up in Aguadosa, California. And, and my partner and his dad did uh, tractor trailer stunts. They did jackknives, the jackknife king. That's who they were. And after the accident, they just put me in the office answering phones. I could do that. I couldn't drive anymore. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, eventually, you know, after I was back for a while, my partner, he had, he played some guitar. So he brought an acoustic guitar and he just, he put racing stickers all over it. He raced sprint cars. So he would sticker everything up and he just threw it up against the wall in the office. And eventually I just started picking it up. He knew I would. Yeah. And so I'd sit there and eventually, you know, five minutes would turn into 10, 20, 30. And so that, yeah, that's how I did it. And, but it was all, my ear had to be the judge because the fingers couldn't. So my ear got really good. You know, I could tell the difference between a, a B and a quarter 
be quarter tone, you know, <laughs> because I couldn't feel it. So I had to hear it. And, but it worked. And um, little by little, I started putting things together. And um, then there was a guy up there, a, a client of my partner's dad. He was a cowboy. I call him Cowboy Roy. And he'd have these hoot nannies up at his farm Friday nights. And he'd ask me every time I saw him, come on up Friday, come on up Friday. And for years, it was no, 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 no. And it took about five, six years. And finally, I said yes. And I went up there and did a little picking, a little grinning. Everybody was real friendly. And uh, it started coming back. It started coming back. Eventually, I got the Strat out because I got an SRV Strat with mile high action with mm. thir with thirteens on it, which are thicker than my acoustic. Ugh, brutal. <laughs> so, so to be able to play, um, I decided the only way I'm going to get my way back is if I can play all of the Danzig solos and all the Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff on acoustic guitar. If I can do it on acoustic guitar, I can do it on anything. Wow. And it was very painful. Um, but it, it was just like when you go up to play baseball or softball and you put the big steel donut on the bat and you swing it and then you take it off and you can swing the bat that much faster. Weight training. Yeah, but I would, I wouldn't take the donut off the bat. I would go up to the plate with the donut on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and force myself to hit the ball anyway, even if it didn't go very far. Next week, I'd still have that donut on, and it would go a little bit further. So it took years of that, um, and then there would be little spurts. You know, I'd have a surgery, and I'd get a little bit more feeling back, and. Uh, you know, so I, it gave me hope, you know, it, it, it kept me in there and my family and friends, you know, they, I just said, don't say anything, don't say anything. And, and eventually that turned into, we go to a bar and there'd be a band on stage. It's somebody I knew. And one of my buddies would be a jerk and say, guess who's sitting at the bar? I wasn't drinking alcohol, but they're like, just guess who's sitting at the bar. And then somebody, you know, all of a sudden I hear. <laughs> And people would be pushing me up on the stage, but it, I couldn't do it. You yeah. know, I, I couldn't play Mother. It took a long time to be able to play that one again. That must uh, have been, um, that must have been, I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been to be, to feel the push and the pull of all of that at the same time and knowing what's right for you versus what everybody wants of you. <laughs> I'll tell you what hurt worse. And it's funny because, it, you know, you'll laugh at my perspective, but. What really pissed me off was all these bands that had opened up for Danzig. Soundgarden's now getting huge. White Zombie, Rob Zombie's getting massive. Marilyn Manson's getting massive. Corn, all these groups are blowing up. And I'm like, I remember when they were sitting on the stage, you know, playing with my guitars. Yeah. You know, and now they're like massive. So, but you just, you accept, you feel it. It hurts, right? because you want to be out there because you're like, you know, but you can't and you don't know if you're ever going to get there again. And then you're like, well, it doesn't matter because all the people that like Danzig when I was in it, they've all moved on. They've all forgotten about me. So I'll just stay off the radar and have my little company and practice with my little cowboy friends and, and hopefully get better. Uh, I hate to interject, but th that's completely not true. Everybody always you know as a i mean we're friends yeah yeah, but yeah you're as right a, as you're a right. fan even going back to the late 90s as a kid i was like man where's jc you know so nobody forgot about you you know just just to clarify i appreciate that i'm just like i said it was it was from when you're in your own head of course of course and you remember when you were at your peak and you're like you're at the bottom of the mountain again, looking up going, Oh man, you know, can I, can I do it? And even if I do do it, will anybody care when I get there? Yeah. So that was the mental challenge was, um, equal or greater than the physical challenge. The physical challenge was pain of course. And, and, but pain is just a way of measuring things and your body telling you, okay, where the issues are. Right. 
we can all, you know, pain is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not afraid of pain. Uh, but the mental, emotional, the, the doubt, the knowing your own worth and value because you, you had to be a bit, not a perfectionist, but a strive to be a perfectionist to drive yourself to get to that level the first time. Sure. So it's, it's like this constant mind game of talking yourself out of the negative and back into the positive and hoping that you fall somewhere in between. Um, two things. One, uh, I just to piggyback on what Ace is saying, from my perspective, from getting into Danzig and being a Danzig fan, from, you know, the early days of like internet chat rooms and chat boards, there yeah. was never a time where you or the original lineup of the band was forgotten in any way, shape or form. It's always, it's always been out there and it's always revered i think it's sort of cemented its own place in you know the legacy of this music and the other thing that i wanted to say um that i find absolutely you know it's funny i i had read an interview where you briefly talked like a print interview where you briefly spoke about some of these experiences yeah but it pales in comparison to hear you actually verbalizing it in such detail and it's such a powerful story of not giving up and what i want to ask you next or what i'm curious to know is and maybe you don't know this at the time as you're going through it but when you reflect back almost 20 years now yeah um what in your if, if you can answer this question maybe you can't maybe you don't know or maybe you don't know consciously maybe you know subconsciously what kept you going what kept the drive because the idea of like of seeing your hands, you know, going through this traumatic experience, you see the state of your hands, the state of your abilities after, you know, you know, being on MTV and, and, and touring around the world and one being one of the most revered metal players ever in the history of, of the genre. And to get back to this or to get to this place where you literally have to start over, um, did you know consciously at the time that you just had to do this? What was driving you? No, I, um, I was, I, I mean, I was broken. Um, the, the, the physical work was just part of, you have to try and get better. If you don't move it, you will lose it. So yeah. if, if you sit there and do nothing, you're never going to get anywhere. If you push as hard as you can, there's a chance that you might get somewhere, but you'll never be where you were. Um, and then, you know, I had, I dropped out of the music scene. Um, I had different friends. Um, I, I'd gotten married, uh, I gotten engaged when I was in the hospital and before the cert well after in between surgeries basically uh so guys out there when you're medicated on morphine do not propose in a hospital <laughs> uh it seems like a great idea at the time because you're happy to be alive but it's not going to resolve anything <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but I digress. Note to self. Um, so the thing was, I, I understand what you're saying, man, you must have been driven to do this. I'm going to get backed out. No, that wasn't it at all. It was almost the opposite, trying to come to terms with that's never going to happen. What am I going to do now? Yeah. You know, but I, I just mean I what can I'm sorry to interject. I just I mean in the sense it from what it seems, the observation of hearing your story, yeah, it seems like it's almost like a primal instinct that you so, had to yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So no, I so this is what you're asking. So I know exactly what you're asking. So the answer to the question is um I didn't do it. The the music did it. The music you know, my ear was trained. You know, from a very early age, I came from a family of musicians. My dad was a trumpet player in a big jazz band, right? So I've been around music my whole life. And so my ear was sophisticated. And it still worked. You know, when the hearing came back and the other one, apparently it was a skull fracture that, that took out the hearing and it started to come back. So that also, as my body healed, my brain started to get better as well. And um, so I had to use what I could. Um, and eventually it was just, it just came back to me that, you know what? Yeah, it's, I tried to avoid it. I tried to deny music. I tried to hide from it, um, but I just couldn't because it wasn't really me. Yeah. And I can remember a few years <clears throat> after that uh, a friend of mine, um, he was a great guy. His name is Noel and his wife is Patty. They would invite me over to their uh, home for holidays. They knew I was raised Catholic and they were Mexican Latina. So they had these huge family gatherings and uh, Noel was a guitar player and he would always hand me a guitar. Sorry about that. Hang on. And he would have acoustic guitars around and, um, and I didn't really know the people or whatever. So they would put a guitar in my hand. I would sit in a corner and they put a big plate of food up there and I would just kind of noodle. They would invite me over. They would feed me all this great food, pay a lot of attention to me, uh, make me feel good about myself. Even gave me a job at one point. Um, cause I'm like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. And I just, I started playing um gradually I, I couldn't do it up to speed Let's see if I can get this. you hear that yeah yeah okay so i just started working things right hand started working first and so it wasn't all crushed up and damaged so it could do its thing and with help and therapy and my friends saying just don't try too much just go slow and I started playing some of the still pop around I always play this song because I remember and I was like yeah Beethoven went deaf you know <laughs> right now yeah. I'm not I'm just saying so little melodies I started playing and uh, you know, they the music they liked was different, but we found a common ground. So I started going to parties, you know, playing playing for my dinner at, at holidays at, at <laughs> Easter, and Christmas, yeah. yep, and all We've that all kind of there. stuff. And uh, and then I did start drinking. Uh, you know, my marriage started falling apart, and I just self medicated. And the only thing that kept me from going over the edge was the guitar. 
And so I started forcing myself to play it more and more and more. And the rubber band clamps, I just kept cranking them tighter and tighter and tighter. And just like, you know, enduring way more than the doctors wanted me to. But I was like, uh, you know, I got it. I got it. And it's still confidence took years to come back. Um, but I learned that, especially for older students that still want to get to a higher level, but their bodies aren't cooperating. Our ears are so sophisticated since we've been listening to music since the time we were a child. There are arguments that even before we were born, we were listening to music. So we have this sophistication in our ear. Um, and if we can harness the patience to let that ear guide our hands until they discover and put the pieces together that one note at a time, one mental message at a time, and millions and millions of mistakes and failed attempts later, it is possible to come back. That's my message. That is, wow. That is, uh, I just, first of all, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, that is really powerful and needs to be a separate video of its own from this, <laughs> just how John Christ taught himself how to play guitar again. And, you know, the other, that's the other thing too, is like, obviously there were a lot of people that helped you, yeah. but the other observation that I have from listening to your story and we'll move on, let's move on into, we have, we have much to cover. Right. Um, we're going to tap in the time machine in a second, but the last observation is that, uh, that, the you had a lot of support and you had a lot of you know medical help and you know doctors are doing the surgery and stuff but there was really only one person that could teach you how to play guitar again and that was you yeah you taught yourself how to do that right you know yeah, it's definitely a story of pers uh almost a perspiration of pers it, <laughs> perseverance well let me tell you yeah the perspiration was there <laughs> <laughs> and 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 to such a point that anybody that knows me knows that uh like stevie ray Vaughan, you know i i love my coffee sweet in the morning i'm crazy about my tea at night right yeah so on the weekends um or when i wasn't working it was you know like dave grohl said fresh pot make a fresh pot bonus yeah. cup <laughs> and yep and i'd be sitting there in these you know sloppy old shorts or or gym outfit and everything and and a guitar going from one to the next yes and um and sweating after hour and after hour you get so into it when you actually hit a zone and you realize that you're making progress you're so worried that it's going to be taken away from you that you're going to lose it that you mm. don't that you don't want to stop yeah mm. you know and it doesn't matter how badly you smell or how much you know when the last time you ate or went to the bathroom you just when you can get to the point where none of that gets in then you're finally getting to the point where you know wax on wax off you're exhausted now we go to work yeah right because as guitar players we've cataloged thousands tens of thousands of little licks and little patterns and little scales and little phrases Right, because our ears are sophisticated too. But for us to be great, you have to have a massive vocabulary of chops. Of course. And the problem is those patterns and chops can get in the way of our own creativity and progress because we get so obsessed with the absolute perfect execution of those. And you know, some people, okay, if I do it three times, great, that's good. I'll move on. Well, then they're rigid idiots. dogma. Yeah, then there are idiots like me that have a, a big jar of 100 guitar picks over here and an empty one, and I'm not moving on from this lick until that one's full and this one's empty. Mm -hmm. But, and, and that's too much a lot of times. So modulation, moderation, um, and yeah, dogged persistence, just like that, is that a beautiful pit bull in the background there? Yeah. That, that when they grab onto something, they don't want to let go. <laughs> and, 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 and when finally I realized that, you know, it, it wasn't about, I'm going to come back and be a rock star and blah, 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 blah. It was, I'm quietly going to do this just to freaking prove it to myself that I can. And because I want to, for me, 
yeah. uh, up until that point in my life, everything had been for somebody else. And I did not know until much later that by living for other people and their desires, um, I thought there was value in it, but all it really ended up doing was it gave me a place to put time and energy and effectively avoid doing the work on myself. Mm. And uh, so that we get off deep, that <laughs> went a little bit deep there. But no, 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 it's never, it's never deep enough. That was beautiful. Thank you for that. It was great. Yeah. So I realized, you know, uh, whether it was guitar, whether it was sports, whether it was weight training, whether it was, you know, the, the horrible hobby that rock stars have on the road of sport dating, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we even couple up with, with partners that we think we can help. And that makes us feel better about ourselves because we're helping them and other, and we get attention for it when really it's just a distraction to not do the real work. Codependency. And then we can blame the world for our troubles and be the victim. It has nothing to do with us. Yeah. <laughs> it's all being done to us. So, you know, but in the, in the midst of it, none of these revelations were coming up in those decades when I was coming back because it was just sort of, yeah, what do I do now? You know, now the universe is, is gut punch me, you know, and saying, and I'm, I'm going, okay, I'm paying attention. Are you telling me I'm done? I should go somewhere else and try something. I mean, I, you know, I, I went on job interviews. I tried to get jobs in different places just going, you know, maybe I'm not supposed to be music. Maybe I'm not a musician. Maybe this is finally, you know, the world, God, whomever, higher power, whatever you want to say, just saying, this is it. This is your last sign. Yeah. You know, what, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? And, uh, and I said, I'm not sure, but I'm going to practice while I figure it out. Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing, man. That really, I mean, you need to be like, you need to be like on the, you need to be speaking like publicly. Is that like, my, is that my Ted talk right there? That is, that is the best <laughs> Ted bit, talk. But, no, it's completely inspirational. So oh. I mean, there's that. So just un, like amazing. seriously un, like what a, what a, I mean, you are a power of example. Uh, I mean, what a story, man. I mean, what a freaking story. Um, and I'm going to shift gears on us. Yep. I'm going to shift gears. We're going to hop in the time machine. I like to do a little Wayne's world. We go, diddle -doo, diddle -doo, diddle -doo. we go back hot, in time. <laughs> hot, tub ti hot tub time machine. Hot tub, sure. Or a hot tub time machine. We're going to go back. We go, whoa. It's the, oh, yes. Yes, it's perfect. Perfect. Time machine music. 